Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is our last session of today's conference. Uh, so my name is Allison Laferlita. I'm the executive director for the Nonprofit Resource Hub. If you've been with us all day, you've seen me all day. Um, but if you haven't and you're a nonprofit and you don't know about us, we are here to support you, our nonprofit leaders and volunteers, supporters, Board members, you name it, we are here to help you provide support, resources, education, and really awesome events like today's. Um, if you are not familiar with us and you want to join as a nonprofit, it is free of charge to you. So please hop on over to nonprofitresourcehub.org and you can become a nonprofit partner today. Uh, today, we are going to be covering a topic of discussion with your peers in the industry. Uh, we're gonna be talking about insights, challenges, and strategies. And we have some really amazing leaders here who are very well known and very well respected, uh, who you're gonna hear from in terms of you know, what they're facing. I find that oftentimes we are in silos. And when we get out to an event, especially in the nonprofit community, when we get out to an event, we sit at a table, we're like, Oh my God, you too. It feels like we're almost in therapy together and we don't have the time to talk about these things. So this time right now is dedicated towards that. If you have questions, you are certainly welcome to put them in the chat. Um, and again, I'm Allison Laferlita. I'm the executive director. Please let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we have up first and I will have everybody speak for themselves. Uh, let's move on to Mike Rosen, welcome. Hi, Let's see if Mike is in a nightclub. I, I hope I'm not. No, uh, you're good. You hear me okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Rosen. I'm the chief marketing officer of the Guide Dog Foundation for the Blind and America's Vet Dogs, uh, sister national nonprofits uh, that are based in, uh, in Smithtown, New York, uh, on Long Island, but we serve the entire country. Uh, we provide guide dogs and service dogs uh, and facility dogs absolutely free of charge to individuals who are blind or have low vision and to uh, veterans, first responders, and active duty military with physical and or emotional disabilities such as PTSD. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Welcome, happy to have you. Uh, Joe Salamone. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joe Salamone. I'm the founder and executive director of the Long Island Coalition Against Bullying. Uh, we're uh, here in uh, Long Island, uh, servicing Nassau and Suffolk County. We work with uh, families, uh, on the individual on the level, level, dealing with bullying, uh, as well as uh, schools uh, across the island, uh, to you know better uh, address and support families, and uh, you know really happy to be here today and happy to help. Welcome, I'm so happy to have you, Amy. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be on the panel. Thank you so much for having me. I am the founder of Book Fairies and also a co-founder of the National Book Access Association. Book Fairies works to increase access to uh, books for children in under-resourced neighborhoods across Long Island and the five boroughs. Uh, we've donated over 4 million books. And the NBAA is, as Allison said, everyone's working in their silos. This is our goal is to bridge all of the silos together of book distribution nonprofits across the U.S. under one umbrella. And Amy only reads cream-colored books. Yes, absolutely. It's spray painted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start uh, with some questions. And Janelle was my first one. So let's, uh, let's move on to Joe. Joe, um, you know, being a nonprofit leader now for over 10 years, uh, and somebody who is really starting to leave your footprint, um, not only locally, but, but you know, it's getting out there what you're doing. Um, you know, marketing can be a challenge when you are one of a very small staff. Yeah. And especially when you, in particular, are out of the office quite a bit, you, you know, doing your speaking uh, and seminars. Uh, so in terms of marketing, what have you found to be effective marketing strategies um, that you have used to gain awareness with the very limited time, bandwidth, resources that you have available to you? Um, 
Yeah, so uh, you know, a l small background on us. I'm also, in addition to being the ED, I'm also the basically the chief program officer. I'm the one in and out of every school. Uh, so lean and mean is how we operate. Um, I think the best uh, piece of advice I would give about marketing that has really changed the game for us is uh, if you have not uh, signed yourself up for a Canva account, I strongly suggest that you do that. Uh, for us, it has taken a lot of the thought process out of a lot of the marketing pieces because there's so much in there that you can just kind of take ready-made and customize it to fit your your own needs, um, which has been a huge time saver. Um, so, um, you know, we've we've brought a little AI into it as well. I was a little reluctant to jump on the AI bandwagon, and then I realized you're either jumping on it or it's leaving without you, but this is the way the world is going. Um, and uh, still have my scary apprehensions about it, but it's definitely been a very helpful tool to us. Um, you know, the other thing that I think has really helped us with, with you know, getting to, you know, raise awareness and more support is by telling people something that they, they may not know. So what I mean by that is everybody knows the bullying is a problem. You know, every school in America and the world knows it, but what we have found real success in is telling the story of bullying on Long Island. You know, it, it, what national statistics are versus what our statistics are. And our statistics here on the island are very different. Uh, our stats say in a, a middle and a high school scenario, one out of every two kids will not graduate high school without having some level of bullying experience. Um, that is different from the national perspective. So that has, for us, helped us, you know, kind of get the urgency of our local mission uh, you know, it to be taken uh, more seriously um, and and get the resources it needs. But um, so, you know, and we get those statistics by surveying. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that'll come up more in the later part of the session. Uh, so I'll leave that for there for now. But, you know, Canva for sure, AI for sure, and tell your local story, you know, lean on more national things that people will recognize, but figure out how to take that and relate it to your core constituency. Thank you. Uh, Janelle, do we have you back with us? I think so. There she is. Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank, you all for bearing, Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> I appreciate it. Please introduce yourself. Sure. I am Janelle Hopkins. I am the Director of Marketing at Girls Who Code. For those of you who don't know, Girls Who Code is a national nonprofit working to close the gender gap in tech. We have a third grade through 12th grade program and college and career programming. All of our programming is free. We are in most schools uh, throughout the country and about 300 college campuses. And we were formed by uh, Reshma Saljani, who on a campaign trail, she was running for office at the time, noticed that when she would visit schools, she would see not many girls in the STEM clubs or in the different classrooms. So that inspired her to start the organization. Thank you. And uh, while I have you, sure. I may as well ask you a question. Okay. Uh, how do you prioritize marketing efforts with limited resources? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we try to invest heavily in our content strategy across our organic channels. So that for us looks like our newsletters, um, our social media channels. We spend a lot of time and effort and resources into cultivating uh, content across those channels. So that means like video, TikToks and things. We, you know, we serve like the others on the panel, we serve um, a Gen Z. So we try to meet them where we are, where they are, and we try to utilize what organic resources we have. Uh, something that we also try to maximize are our partnerships where possible, partnering with other organizations to extend both groups' reach. We partner with uh, the Cybersecurity Agency every year for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, we partner with um, the Girl Scouts. We're doing an event with them this weekend. We partner with smaller organizations that are more like social justice issues. Uh, for Women's History Month example, we're partnering with an organization called Muslim Girl, which is a brand and resources for Muslim women. Uh, so we try to like make those connections and, and use organic resources where possible, which comes a bit more naturally. And uh, a unique thing about our campaign work is we actually try to have it funded where possible. So one to two times a year, we run uh, what we call a national brand campaign. And that's for us has looked like our, like microsites. So our, our 
campaigns like Doja Code, where we partner with Doja Cat, and a campaign like Girls Who Code Girls, which was a video game activation. We actually, when we start to think about an idea or a plan around our campaign, we talk to our funding partners and say, hey, we have this idea, but we need the resources. Would you be willing to kind of fund this campaign um, and have your name accredited to the work? So where possible, we rely heavily on our partnerships um, in that area. But recognizing that, I have, a, yeah. I have a feeling you're going to get a lot of questions about that campaign and how you pull it off. Okay, <laughs> happy to answer. So be prepared. Okay. I, I'm sure that you've piqued the interest of many. Uh, so I'm going to bounce over to Mike. Thank you so much, Janelle. Mike, uh, can you give examples of successful social media campaigns that you have per you have engaged in and your with your audience, and it has actually prompted and resulted in action? There we go. Um, uh, rookie error, I guess. Um, I just want to thank you guys again. Yeah, we, you know, social media is a key driver of what, what my team does, you know, and, and, you know, and we're a team, you know, a small team, we're a total of five people um, that's providing all the marketing in integrated marketing, social media, earned media, publicity, paid media, you name it, um, running our websites across two national organizations. So, you know, my team of, you know, and I'm giving, giving them a shout out of Allison and Jamie and Bill and Amanda and, and Casey and Dina do an enormous amount of work. Social media, I'll give three examples um, that sort of come top of mind. Um, we have a program called Puppy with a Purpose. And that's a program in which we've partnered with professional sports teams. We've partnered with corporations and media companies in which those teams are helping us literally raise future service and guide dogs um, for America's Vet Dogs and the Guide Dog Foundation. So you may have seen us, you know, we've, we, we've partnered in the New York area with the New York Islanders and the New York Mets. Uh, we recently launched a new pup with the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, we just launched a puppy with NBC Universal um, through their HR department, um, who visited visits Thirty Rock, um, you know, every week and is going to various departments, specifically working with their Veterans Employee Resource Group and their Disabilities uh, Resource Group. Um, and that program, one of the great successes we've seen over time, isn't just the amplification that those partners give to our message. But on Instagram in particular, we've been taking advantage of the, the relatively new collab feature, the collaboration feature. So, you know, combined across our two organizations, we reach about 300,000 individuals across every social media platform we're on. And for Vet Dogs, for America's Vet Dogs, it's at America's Vet Dogs. Um, and for the Guide Dog Foundation, it's at Guide Dog Foundation, except on X, where we don't have as much copy. So it's foundation gets replaced with FDN. Um, that you know the collab has amplified our reach tremendously because it now we can do one post we could partner with these teams that have their own big giant platforms and we're seeing a notable increase of, you know most recently i'll say on instagram 3.75 almost four percent increase in our number of new followers who are coming to us through these organic posts about the work we do and for us our calls to action are simple we need more people to apply for our services. We want to get more people, you know, with service dogs and with guide dogs, absolutely free of charge. Um, to do that, we need more volunteers. So we want more people to learn how to be a puppy raiser and give their time and what's what's involved in that. And then we need more people to donate because it costs us fifty thousand dollars for every single service or guide dog that we breed, raise, train, and place. Um, so that's one example. The second one I'd say is very recent. Um, this past week we introduced for our puppy raisers. So we've got 1600 volunteers across the country. And just for an example, we've got 160 employees. So we have a 10 to one ratio of volunteers to employees. About 400 of those volunteers are raising puppies for us. Um, we just launched and my team uh, sort of led the charge on this brand new volunteer puppy raising vests for our dogs so that the, they are branded well, so they are comfortable wearing a vest before they may become a service dog or before they have their guide dog harness on. Um, and our team launched a, a campaign across all of our channels asking our volunteer raisers to send us their photos of their dogs in their new vests. And it was a grand slam for us. You know, we had thousands upon thousands of engagements. And for us, social media is really all about engagement. It's not just about 
cute content. We're very fortunate. We have dogs and we have puppies. And we could, if we wanted to, all day and night, just post cute pictures of puppies. But the dogs that we breed, raise, train, and place are a means to an end. Ultimately, we're in the business of changing and, and in many cases, saving the lives of the people we serve. Um, so we're, we want to tell those human stories. Those two examples are good examples of how we're hitting two core targets for us, prospective applicants, those who have given to our country or who are blind or have low vision, and sharing their stories. We ultimately need to share and center the voice of our people. So you'll see if you follow us on social media, and I hope you do, a lot, yes, we'll, we'll occasionally post cute pictures of puppies because it's good for engagement. But much of what we do is about the person and the puppy, whether that person be the handler who is ultimately benefiting from the service or the volunteer who is helping us raise that pup uh, so we can fulfill our mission and advance our mission. Yeah, no, thank you. And it's funny because uh, throughout the day, I've kind of captured that there is a very common theme and or, or a couple really. Um, and it seems that it doesn't matter if your organization is brand new, small, or very large. Partnerships, collaborations, these are very important, whether you put it into your storytelling, whether you put it into your social media marketing, you have to have those to tell. And I'm also learning how important and you know how apropos with the title of this entire conference, really developing your stories and um, utilizing the stories from those who are benefiting from the services that you're providing. So that's that's really great to hear. Thank you. Does anybody want to add to that? Because I want to open this up to everybody after um, after I ask the question. So feel free to jump in. Does anybody have anything? Okay. Well, I know this is not a shy crowd, so I'm not worried about you jumping in when you want to. Um, so Amy, could you offer us, oh, no, Amy, can you provide a specific example of how, and Amy, Amy has completely, I'll just say, poured herself into AI in the past seven or eight months, if I have my timing correct. Um, she's really dedicated herself to understanding it and how it can help a nonprofit. Um, so could you provide us with some specific examples of how AI has enhanced your nonprofiting marketing efforts? Um, if you want to talk about personalized messaging or targeting outreach or data analysis. So for those that are smaller, that might just be dipping their toes into the AI pond, or even those that are a little bit more advanced, what have you found to be very helpful? So for me, AI has revolutionized everything that I do. I'm on it all day, morning, noon, night. <clears throat> and my, my biggest piece of advice to everybody that's on here is just to start using it. And in this case, when I'm talking about AI, I'm talking about generative AI, which is ChatGPT, Claude 3. And from everything that I've learned, it takes about 10 hours of just playing on it. There, there is no secret sauce to using generative AI. It is simply just going on ChatGPT and you're putting in your question. Um, I'm seeing a lot with people that are small organizations. This is where AI is going to be so key for you. When you're a brand new organization, you can use AI not only as your intern, but you can also use it as your mentor. And you can go on and say, I am a one person operation and I need to create a social media campaign around this one program. And my goal is to uh, increase the number of volunteers that are involved. Give me ideas. So it's not complex. People talk about prompt engineering and courses that you have to take. Just go on and start asking questions. Um, to go back real quick in terms of specific ways that you can use it, I'll give you one real easy way, which is that when, when you look at how many stakeholders that you have involved within your nonprofit, um, you have your staff, you have your volunteers, your donors, your recipients, you can take one message that you have, uh, whether it is a social media post, a newsletter, a thank you note, you can put that into ChatGPT or Claude 3 and that same post just say, please change this to um, attract small level donors. Uh, please change this post to encourage volunteers to become involved. 
or how can I reword this post to better capture the emotions of our recipients? So you're taking one item and then AI is doing the rest of the work for you to gear your messaging for each of your stakeholders. Amy, for those that, again, are still somewhat new, could you just give a brief explanation of the difference between ChatGPT and Claude 3? I can, but it's going to change tomorrow. So oh. is the well, thing- for today. Right, right. So honestly, here's the thing with AI. Whatever I tell you today is going to be different tomorrow. Is, well, let's uh, just say it's one easier for somebody who's new new to it to use there there's a lot of really good information so chat gpt 3 is free for anybody who wants to use it it is slower it's more basic it is uh it's it's not as intuitive as chat gpt 4 chat gpt 4 is a paid version it's 20 dollars a month i highly recommend it there is a significant significant difference between three and four Five is going to come out this summer. Cannot wait. However, if you don't want to pay that money, there are new items coming out all the time. Right now, Claude 3 is almost as good as ChatGPT 4, and it is free. So you can definitely use Claude 3 as well. Um, ChatGPT4, the reasons that you would want to look for that one, besides the fact that it gives you that generative AI, it can analyze PDFs, it can analyze spreadsheets, it can generate um, images that you can use for your marketing, and hopefully soon you'll be able to use Sora, which is where you can just uh, use a, uh, a simple text wording to generate videos so you can now create your own personalized videos for your nonprofit. Seems very worth it for the $20 a month. So, you know, helpful. And especially for those that are with us that are that are working with very small staff. Um, so Joe, I would hope that you would consider implementing this and spending the $20 a month <laughs> to so, help you. So we, uh, I already do spend the $20 a month on uh, All right. GPT-4. Um, and the biggest thing that I have, uh, really took, taken from it was, uh, we do a lot of surveying and we put all of the survey statistics into it. And I asked it very specific questions to create me narratives around certain columns of data. And we've started already using that in specific marketing pieces, tailoring certain messages to schools versus certain messages to parents. Uh, and we're talking about over the last 11 years, maybe, I mean, at least 300,000 lines uh, of data in the same surveys because we just keep running running the same ones. Um, and it was it was fantastic. Uh, you know, so I, again, like I said, I was a little late to the, the game, but uh, I think I've caught up a little bit. Um, but uh, I definitely echo that chat GPT-4 is definitely worth, uh, if you're looking at GPT, uh, go for four over three at $20. I'm, I'm, I know, listen, we're lean and mean. We we found it. So um, Joe, I'm actually, this actually leads into our next question because I, I do think that it's, we're talking about storytelling and how are, how are you balancing your storytelling with conveying impact authentically, right? If Especially if you're using um, AI, you don't want it to sound like it's not from the heart and it's, and you started this organization. So this is from your heart. Yeah. Um, so how do you kind of balance that authentically in your messaging? And maybe it is with using AI where we all know sometimes if you use AI, you're like, I would never say this. So how do you, how do you balance it? So your messaging is still coming from your heart, but it's still making an impact. So uh, good question. The the one thing I wanted to say about an earlier question, it just kind of hit me was something that sure. one of my mentors told me about marketing. There are two schools of thought when it comes to marketing, looking at it as an investment and looking at it as an expense. Uh, and a lot of people don't get the difference between that. And I've got a board that we still work through that. You know, when they look at the balance sheet and they say, can we really afford that? And the question really should be is, well, are we going to accomplish our goals without it? Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. But if you look at it as an expense, it kind of limits your ability really to, to be able to effectively 
get your 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 mission out there. Um, as far as kind of balancing, uh, obviously we were have a very unique mission where we're dealing with very personal stories. You know, when the community reaches out to us and is telling, you know, and we hear it, and our response staff, um, who are all volunteers, are talking to families. It's it's not about stuff that you can very easily take and go put on social media and story tell. You know, a lot of this is confidential. A lot of it is you don't want to, you know, shine, you know, put put a, a brighter light on people and their struggles. Um, so what we've started to do was take that and kind of the, the debate we're having now is, you know, we've got good stories that people will let us use, but we don't have, you know, name, we don't have uh, pictures. And and how valid is the story if somebody can't see the person, but they're reading something about it? Um, so we're we're kind of going back and forth on that, and I won't pretend to have the answer on that, but we do uh, use our stats to tell more of a story, uh, mm -hmm. and use our statistics in conjunction with the stories. So you know we might say um, sixty two percent, I think, is the statistic we use now that uh, of the middle school kids we speak to, sixty two percent of them say, um, that our presentations and our work in schools have shifted their opinions and thought process when it relates to bullying. Here's one of those experiences um, where I don't have to put a picture, I don't have to put a name, I can put that stat to set the stage and then put another piece underneath it that's coming from a kid, um, you know, and, and doing that. When it comes to the AI piece, um, I experience that all the time. I have a very unique way of speaking, especially public speaking speeches I give. And what I will use AI for is I have to get, I'm a keynote at this event. This is my topic. You know, give me a two minute something. It doesn't sound at all like I want it to sound like it's coming from me, but I take it and it kind of just spins my wheels to get my thought processes turning. Sometimes I use a couple of lines from it, but it just at least get gets me to start being able to write my own rather than to have to sit down and stare at a, a blank screen. Um, so sure. we use it for that a lot. And I, and I think before we go to the rest of the panelists, I, I do want to say, um, because I don't think Joe would say it himself, yeah. Joe's story, it will he will tell his own story and what his, what inspired him to start this organization. And he, he uses his face because his, people who are receiving the support from their organization are minors. So you can't really use their pictures without them maybe feeling more exploited than they already have been. Correct. But Joe has always stepped up to be the face of the organization and tell a story that is so unbelievable and beautiful and emotional and really speaks to anybody who would want to support this organization. So you need to be creative also in your storytelling. Sometimes it's not appropriate to share photos and, and you want to be respectful of those people. And so you were, you know, you stood up and said, you'll be that face and you'll be the face of that kid. So, uh, you know, and I know you'll never tell anybody, but I will. So thank you. Um, I do want to open it up to the other panelists, however, to share maybe their experiences because the storytelling has been the overarching theme of today. And how do you tell your stories, all of you, if anybody wants to set, step up, how do you tell them authentically? Um, not even with, with the AI being involved, but how do you tell your story authentically to make sure it's resonating in your messaging and then garnering the support that you're looking for? I'll throw it out to anybody who wants to talk about it. Maybe Janelle, do you guys want to go? Um, yes, Amy, do you jump in first one or two? Uh, I'll just give something super quick and then Mike, you can cover that. So just to go back to what Joe was talking about in terms of tone, when you're using AI, you can actually train it if you're doing chat GPT-4. You can train it to learn how you speak just by inputting all of your previous ways that you write or your previous speeches, and it can generate a prompt so that you can use it and it, it will replicate what your language is. So something to do, it's within the custom instruction side. And I think in terms of, you know, similar to, I think, you know, some of the challenges Joe has with the, the you know, the kids that, he, that they're serving and they're supporting and, you know, especially on the America's Vet Dog side of, of our organizations, 
Um, we're dealing with some veterans who have experienced very traumatic experiences in their life, who have very severe PTSD. First thing we say, so every so we have classes come in. So we have, I think right now we have 11 veterans or first responders who are with us on class. They live with us for two weeks on our campus and our student residence. You know, we say to them, our team meets with them usually early on in their stay with us. And the first thing we tell them is, you're here to learn how to be with your dog and how to become a handler. And, and this is the beginning of your journey on changing your life. Um, if you want to participate in media or marketing or promotion, that's great. If you want to share your story, that's wonderful. And if you don't want to, that's fine too. And you know we're in the business of decreasing burden on people, whether they be individuals who are blind or the, or the veterans and first responders we serve. So that's paramount to our team. Um, we'll say it, we say it all the time um, to the people we serve. You do not have to do anything you don't want to do. We will never put you in a position where you're asked to do something you don't want to do. Um, and if you do want to participate, whether it be in interviews in your hometown, because I agree with Joe, a lot of our, our work, because we're national, is local still. We tell stories all over the country, um, you know, because our best referral source is still somebody who benefited from one of our services. But I do think to be authentic to our mission is to be authentic to the stories we tell. And our mission is to help people live without boundaries to really bring them back dignity, bring them back independence, bring them back confidence. So it starts with centering the voice of the people you serve or not centering their voice if they don't want to participate. And I think that's really important. And for some marketers, I think that could be difficult because we want to tell these incredible stories, but the story doesn't have impact if you know that person is reluctant to share it. Um, so we'll help them. Even some may say, I want to tell my story, but there are parts of my story I don't want to tell. So our team will work with them before they go on an interview. And we'll talk to the media beforehand even and say, don't ask these. Those are off limits. And we'll have very frank conversations. And generally, listen, most of the folks we work with, especially on the, on the storytelling front, when we're not controlling the story, when we're working with the press, they want to tell these stories too. They want to, they want to honor the people that we honor by serving them. Um, but I think it's important that it starts with really being listening to the folks you work with who are the reasons you do what you do, and then letting them tell their stories their way and helping them do that. Yeah, I think it all really boils down to respect, right? And um, and you're always going to find somebody who doesn't mind a camera, and you're going to find people that do. So that's, you know, that's just human nature. Um, I want to jump over to Janelle for a second. And, and again, once Janelle answers, I'm going to open it up to all of you, because I think this is also an important question to ask. Um, so let's say that you have run into some sort of controversy or a challenge. Um, in your marketing campaigns. Maybe somebody doesn't like the way that you approach the social issue. Maybe somebody's, you know, maybe the intention was was supposed to be delivered one way, but it was received another. Uh, has anybody had an experience that they want to share and how they manage it? It does not have to be anything, you know, terrible, but it could have been a hiccup that you had to learn how to manage with your marketing. So I'm gonna start with Janelle. And then we will uh, we'll move on to everybody else if you'd like to add to it. Sure. So our target audience is uh, 13 to 24. And as most of you know, they are not shy about calling anybody and anything out. We've been called out about the types of organizations we've partnered with. We've been called out about the use of AI imagery because, you know, there's some, you know, controversies there. We've been called out about things like gift cards, <laughs> they, where we purchase gift cards as, as gifts do. Uh, something that we firmly believe in is trying to avoid mission creep. And what we mean by mission creep is that while we are an organization that services young women and women and non-binary students, we are not an organization that is built to handle all of the challenges that face our community, nor are we equipped. We do not have the expertise. We do not have the training. And to be honest, our focus is on closing the gender divide in tech. While we acknowledge and we hear 
them when our students come to us and they say, you know, uh, why haven't you spoken out about this or what's happening with this or you're real quiet about that issue. We thank them. We acknowledge them. We don't try to hide or delete comments. Sometimes it's a matter of one of members of our team reaching out to them individually and hearing them out and say, you know, we appreciate you sharing that perspective. Here is our stance or, you know, here's what we believe. And we try to um, kind of recommend other organizations that are doing the social justice work or advocacy work that have greater resources to help the students kind of get involved. Also, we encourage them to utilize the tools that they have. A lot of our students create projects and coding projects around social justice and climate change and things like that. We encourage them, we don't discourage it. Um, but when it's come time to like take action, there have been times where we've had to maybe um, end a partnership. Uh, we've had a previous partner that was in the news for some, um, kind of employee uh, kind of discrimination things pertaining to women. And that's like a simple no brainer. We can't partner with those kinds of organizations that are in direct conflict with our mission. But any other time, if it's a matter of people didn't like what we said about something or they believe that we're too silent, um, we just have to be mindful of our space. We hear you, we acknowledge you, we value your opinion, but if we get into the space where we're trying to answer everything, then that becomes a little bit trickier to manage. And we're not we're not shy about admitting who, you know, acknowledging who we are. We are for, we provide education and free tech programming. That's not to, and when there are times, there are big issues that affect our community. We, we do speak out about the book bans that affects our work. Some of our books have been banned. Uh, we do speak out about when there are data privacy concerns around reproductive tech health apps. That is something that is actively affecting our community and intersects with technology. So that's something that we try to keep in mind when we are facing these criticisms. There are definitely moments to take action um, if we are in direct conflict with our mission or we're aligned with partners who are in direct conflict with our mission. But when there are instances where people are just upset because you know they felt like we were too quiet, that's an issue for maybe a, a conversation or we speak with a facilitator or the teacher or you know, their program facilitator and have a conversation with the students. Say, you know, we hear you. We're taking that into consideration. And we acknowledge that there's always opportunity to change things. Uh, there are some partners, you know, we might reevaluate or reconsider the relationship as we hear different perspectives. But um, it's definitely a learning curve. I would say we'd have it all figured out. Like there's always going to be a challenge, a conflict, a war, uh, a thing in the news, politics, that's going to be at the forefront of our students' mind. And we try to bear that well, in mind and hear them and out. I also think it's an interesting point that you just brought up is that you are actually serving a population now that probably other nonprofits don't really, where they, they are more vocal and they are going to tell you that they don't care for what you're doing. And you need to keep that in mind, right? But it's great to still be open-minded and hear what they have to say and try to accommodate where you can. And But not every nonprofit has to worry about that. So your particular population is certainly keeping you in check. And that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that can be graded and, you know, terrible at the same time, maybe. Who yeah. knows? But I, I think it's so interesting that you brought that up. And that's a really good example. And thank you. I appreciate that. I saw that Joe was raising his hand. Okay, so yeah. he may want to add to that. And Janelle, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? No, no, that's it. Thank you for giving okay. this. Thank you. Joe? Uh, yeah, what I was going to say, kind of echoing Janelle's, uh, you know, mission creep. Uh, we have conversations like that a lot. Uh, I'm a very big believer of stay in your lane. And if you're ever going to kind of veer from your lane, at least put your blinker on to kind of let everybody know and only put your blinker on when you've got a reason to switch lanes. Um, we faced this somewhat recently uh, when the uh, the situation in the Middle East unfolded, uh, where, you know, obviously it was horrific. Um but we we weren't entirely sure, like, is that our lane to get involved in? Uh, you know, anti-Semitism is a very specific, you know, while it crosses over with bullying because people get bullied because of their religion, that is a, a topic that that's not our lane. So we made strategic partnerships to address that and kind of bring them into the fold with us. 
we only actually started saying anything publicly about it when we started really getting the direct feedback that our core constituents here in Nassau and Suffolk County were truly feeling a an impact from that, where we were seeing a, a, a like a hockey stick rise in you know kids in middle and high school experiencing things like swastikas drawn on their desks, and then it became a time where okay, we should say something about this, and we should get ourselves more involved in this. But getting involved in it doesn't mean that you make it your mission now. You know, and I think that's where the strategic partnerships come in handy. Bullying has a crossover with racism, but we are not the authority on racism. Bullying has a crossover with anti-Semitism, but we are not the best people to speak about that. There are the Holocaust Memorials and Tolerance Center, for one, is much more qualified than we are. But where there's crossover and it's appropriate, you know, speak about it. But don't put yourself in a situation that you know, you're 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 changing lanes hard and without a blinker, and you're getting yourself into territory that you probably could have avoided. Um, I've personally seen it, you know, in, in where I'm scrolling through LinkedIn and I see other organizations putting out statements and such. And it's I ask myself, I'm like, why did you feel the need to comment on that? You know, because then when you get those comments and you start making your core audience upset, you know, could you could that have been avoided? Um, so, you know, a firm believer in, you know, staying in your lane and moving over when need be and, you know, strategic partnerships help that with allowing you to take a position, but not one that is going to, you know, water down your core mission. Thank you very much. Yeah, sometimes that's just the knee jerk reaction is to kind of jump on the, and then you don't realize you're probably not prepared for what's to come. So, yeah, so taking a moment, breathing, thinking about those partnerships and who you can collaborate with it certainly is a, is a really smart way to go. I think um Amy, Alex, Amy oh I'm sorry go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead Mike. No 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 Amy, go go go. Have, go. Jump in or? No go jump in. Okay. Jump think, away. You know, I, I think it's this. also important to have um to have clear understandings of whoever on your team is involved in social media that there are some policies in place and there's some processes in place when something does happen. Um so well uh, we 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 too we avoid most social issues and and the not the 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 sector of the nonprofit world we're in generally doesn't get engaged in too many social issues. Although the people we serve cross the spectrum, right? Uh, of, of, of what they believe and their affiliations, et cetera. Um, but you know, we recently had a, a situation where um, we were talking about puppy raising and just like younger folks may be very vocal and, and you know, generous, I think we all have passionate followers, right? And our puppy raisers are extraordinary. They are so passionate about the work they do and think about it. they're giving up a year and a half of their life to raise a puppy and then giving it back to us to give to a veteran or an individual who's blind, et cetera. Um, but we had somebody comment on a, on a post we did that was not, a, not didn't put us in the greatest light. Um, and we had to have a conversation about, do we delete the comment, right? Do you delete the comment? Do you hide the comment? And we generally now have a policy where unless it is an offensive comment, right? Where it's using language that is unacceptable, if it's calling an individual out, so it's being disrespectful to a specific person, whether that be another member of our virtual, our social community, or one of our puppy raisers, or one of our staff members, or a program graduate. But if it doesn't do that, we're going to allow social media to do what social media does well, usually, which is which is forward advanced conversation, right? Conversation and hopefully respectful conversation. We will step in if we believe and we control our social media pages, that it is becoming disrespectful towards someone uh, else. But I think it is important that, there, you know, that that teams and organizations have clear policies and that on occasion, you communicate those policies out to your social communities so they understand the ground rules of, of engaging so when you will chime in. And I think that's also very important to do regardless of sort of the sector that you're playing in. And that's whether you're a social, you know, whether you're in the nonprofit sector or frankly, you're a big consumer or B2B brand. The the I just one point to that as well, um, and I think this is the part we don't often talk about. We look at external impacts on you know controversy and such. Uh, what we don't necessarily part uh, pay attention to, at least from my perspective, is sometimes when that controversy is caused from within. Uh, you know where you know luckily we avoided this, but we did have a former board member. Uh, who was very vocal about stuff that would not have reflected well on the organization. You know, they are free to post what they want, 
but does there does that ever come in conflict with the fact that they are also a de facto representative of the organization uh so i i think sometimes it's you know does the organization overextend itself but sometimes does the individual land the organization into some potential uh, issues as well? So I think that those have to be looked at as well. And that's where policies about that, you know, and, you know, especially board member social media use or executive social media use, you know, balancing their right to do something while also maintaining the fact that they are a representative. And I have a feeling we could do an entire workshop and webinar just on that. Because, you know, the lines do cross and there there is some gray there. Uh, and I'm sure that there are some organizations that probably have gotten into some level of deeper trouble than, than we are here talking about um, that we're not even aware of, you know, what's going on. But that's probably a much deeper discussion that thanks. Thanks, Joe. You just inspired our next webinar. So appreciate that. Um, does anybody want to add to that before we we move on? Okay, well, you're always welcome to jump in, guys. Uh, so, Amy, I'm looking at the chat, and there's, I just want to let everybody know Amy has provided everybody with links for AI resources that she finds helpful, and she wants to pass that along to you so you can see those. Uh, Amy, there's, there's a lot of talk about the AI in the chat. Um, so, what I want to ask you, and we kind of touched on this a little bit before, but um, when, an organization is new to AI and they want to start using it for their marketing initiatives. What are some tips that you would share with everybody if they're if they're new? Um, I think we have more smaller organizations on this right now. So maybe if you can just kind of focus on if you were a smaller organization new, what would be the tips that you would recommend launching into this marketing campaign using AI? So when you're talking with AI, for the most part, you can just ask it any question that you want. Uh, create a social media post around this event. But what they found is that you're when, the more specific you are, the more tailored the answer is going to be. So <clears throat> generative AI is trained on millions of pieces of data, and it can give you an answer from uh, as, just as many different perspectives. So when you ask chat GPT a question or Claude 3 a question, you want to give it a little bit more focus. So the first thing that you want to do is when you're asking, uh, it's called a prompt. So when you prompt the system, you would first tell it what persona you wanted to take. So you would say, um, assume the role of an expert nonprofit marketing coordinator, or assume the role of a high level donor. So that's going to tell that um, how to answer. Uh, you also want to tell it what kind of format you want. Do you want this in bullet points? Do you want it concise? Do you want it a two-page article? Um, provide the audience that you're directly talking to. And um, the best thing that you can always do is ask it a question and then say, make this prompt better so I get more targeted information. And like I said, everything changes day to day. While I was on this uh, seminar all day, I was reading one of the articles that was posted in the chat. And it gave the example of, let's say you would um, say, craft a social media post attracting more volunteers for my organization. That's fine. But if you say, serve as a dynamic social media strategist, create an active and engaging persuasive social media post to recruit volunteers. We are a nonprofit focused on, and it, it goes on like that. And then you say format, you want engaging, concise social media post. So the more information you get it, give it, the more specific and tailored your response is going to be. And have you, in terms of um, once it creates the messaging, where do you where do you suggest they put it out on? So um, I'm going to give you an example. When I when I use AI myself, I'm I'm a writer, so I write the messaging first, then I put it in to kind of clean it up, and I say who my my target is. But I also prompt it to use the top so the top search terms in Google. So I like it to pull those terms out. But I say this is specific to LinkedIn, 
this is specific to Instagram. Where would you, if, and, and you know, and it, it sucks out a lot of time, even using AI, when somebody's so limited with their time, what would be your recommendation and where they would, should push that out? Um, that messaging out. Uh, in terms and do of- Do they use the same message for everything or do they change the messages about? Right. Well, again, you would have to change the messaging depending on which media that you're using. So LinkedIn is going to be more of those professional um, individuals that you're trying to target. If you're looking at Facebook, you're looking more at the the social and the individuals. So you can tailor it. Um, I would just be careful when you're asking ChatGPT to tailor everything. Uh, they're trained it says it's trained up until March 2023. Then I recently saw it was trained up until October 2023. So just be careful and aware that the information that it's providing you may not be the most accurate and up-to-date information. Um, and the other thing you can do is say, create a social media calendar for me for the month. And so while you have limited time, if you dedicate that one hour to create all your social media posts, they're now done. And every few days, you're just copying and pasting and dropping it into whichever platform you're choosing. Well, Amy, I think you just saved the day for many, many nonprofits with that tip about the calendar. That's awesome. Thank you. Does anybody want to add to that? What have you done? The other is... The other thing I would add to that is while it can create a calendar, which is fantastic, you also, if you don't already have one, should find a buffer or other things like that where you can schedule your posts to go out. Because while you're devoting that hour to creating your calendar, you could also be scheduling those posts. So what we do for things that like, for example, uh, uh, we want to make sure that we don't miss certain awareness days, like today is Autism Awareness Day. We didn't want to miss that. Uh, so on certain things that you know you want to make a post about, you could take an hour and do that for the rest of the year. And then that clears all that out of the way. And then just in between there are putting out your more mission, you know, core stuff. Um, so if you if people haven't looked into that, I think Buffer is like ten dollars a month for one or two licenses or whatever that is. But they're certainly not the uh, the above all and be all. Um, and certain platforms have the program schedule you can do within it as, as it is. Um, I would also echo Amy's a uh, little bit of a warning there about just don't put something into Chat GPT or any generative AI as I've learned. I've kind of tested it out. I have asked it questions that I know the absolute answer and put it in there just to see what answer it's it's going to give me and they're not always correct so don't just put something in there and then right away you know run and take it as gospel you know use your own you know uh uh interrogation skills so to speak and don't be afraid to you know test it out and and you know punch holes in it and make sure that it's giving you the accurate information thank you um guys it's already 258 i can't believe it our time is up, um, but I do want to offer Mike and Janelle uh, an opportunity to share if you'd like before we wrap it up, yeah. if there's anything. I do want to let everybody know uh, you can get in touch with these awesome people on our panel. Uh, everybody has put their contact information in the chat. You can always call us at the Nonprofit Resource Hub if you need to connect with them. For all of you, you know we're always here for you at the Nonprofit Resource Hub to support you. Uh, if there's anything that you want to share after this that maybe comes to mind, you let us know. We'll put it out there for you. The recording for this conference will be ready at some point next week. Um, you know, go ahead and make a big deal out of yourselves because you guys were awesome. Everybody was really fantastic today. And I, and I want to thank all of you. Um, and thank you for the inspiration for my next webinar, Joe. Um, if you need any additional support through the Nonprofit Resource Hub, you know that you can give us a call. Uh, this was a really great day. And I hope that everybody has found some level of inspiration and idea, maybe a potential partner. Um, again, the overarching theme I, I've been hearing all day is learn to tell your story, get your messaging straight, know what you're using when you're using AI, use it carefully, but definitely use it as a tool. And um, really to all everybody that participated today, if you're with us, thank you so, so much. And especially to, to my panel, thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. And if you need to get in touch with everybody, you guys are welcome to call us anytime. 
Uh, and don't be strangers. Let us know what you're doing. We will be happy to put out what you're doing. Share with us. If you're looking for puppy raisers, let us know. We'll find them. I might be one. I We're looking one. for puppy raisers. And so, well, I might raise a puppy. So hang on there. But, and um, you know, never be shy to ask and never be shy to share. So thank you once again, everybody. I wish you all a wonderful weekend and get in touch with us if we can be of any help to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Have Alex. a great day.